Hello and welcome to another episode of the Collab Talk podcast, where we discuss the convergence of technology, business productivity, and collaboration culture. My guest today is Christy Hissa, a certified Scrum Master and General Manager for Kairos. Welcome, Christy. Thanks, Christian. I'm super excited to be here. And we're talking today, for folks that don't know Kairos, and I'll, I'll let Christy kind of introduce her and her company here, but the topic is, and this is a great topic that I've I've been in conversations around this in corporate environments over the years is overhauling meetings to drive efficiency and collaboration. How do we clean up the fact that we have too many meetings? And so that we're going to dive into that today. But why don't you give, give us more of your bio, your background, and more about Kairos? Yeah, of course. I've uh, I've been an operational executive for the better half of a decade now, always in software companies and running the operations to a point of acquisition most recently. So now I am really excited to be leading a startup called Kairos, which is solving one of my personal biggest pet peeves as an operator, and that is wasting time and resources in meetings. Yeah, it, it's a, again, I've worked in companies. Uh, I mean, Microsoft was a great example of this just because it was something that I had been warned about, and but I didn't really believe it until I was there and realized that uh, my entire day is filled with meetings. And then I found myself working extra hours at night or in, first thing in the mornings before meetings started, get in there early to get actual work done. And I, or people would be, I'd be sitting in meetings, a lot of other people that are sitting there trying to get work done in a meeting. They know that they should have probably declined, but for whatever reason, couldn't, they needed to be seen there because it was part of the culture. Like if you're not in those meetings, like, what are you, what are you doing? Well, I'm getting my actual work done. Uh, you know, so that is a, it, is it more of just a, it's a cultural problem or is it, you know, are, are, well, I guess that's a given. It is a cultural problem, but is it something that is, I mean, it seems like it's a pretty consistent issue across, especially larger organizations to work that way. Like work gets done because we have a meeting and we're all sitting there doing our actual work. Yeah, you're addressing a concerning trend that I've seen as well. And it is the drive for busyness. Like for really, and maybe this is part of social media broadcasting everything that you're doing. Maybe this is part of having to really showcase every little bit of work that you're doing and your calendar has to be full to show that you're being productive, which is funny because, I mean, research shows it's the exact opposite, right? Well, in, it's interesting too, because there was this whole move around social collaboration. I mean, when Yammer was big before Microsoft acquired them, and of course now with Teams, we're not talking about the model of the work out loud model, which is about transparency, visibility into what you're working with. That's not what we're talking about. It, it really is like, oh, look at my schedule and I'm so, so busy around this. It was about a month ago, I saw something in the news, some commentary. Uh, there's some study that was done. Uh, I'll have to find this and grab the link to it. Uh, but a, a study was done saying there's like the people who claim that they're busy are like the, the, the least efficient. It's like, it's like the old adage, uh, like, like a clean desk is a sign of someone with too much time on their hands. <laughs> Clutter desk means, Hey, they're legitimately busy or, or they're cluttered. They're messy. So That's... yeah, what, what is the impact of ineffective, inefficient meetings? That's a great question. And I think this hits on a soft spot for me because Oftentimes, leaders underestimate the impact that meetings have. It's just this feeling of like, yeah, big fuzz. We have all these bad meetings, right? Like we're not getting dinged for each one of them. There's not an invoice for every meeting that is coming in. And yet 
I think what we're underestimating here is payroll is one of the biggest expenses on your balance sheet and 20 to 60% of that is tied up in meetings. It's a big investment for a growing organization. And Pat Lynchoni actually said something that really resonated with me, which is after all the years of consulting and management consulting that he's done, if he only has one factor to look at how well an organization is doing and whether they're living up to their potential, he's not going to ask for a financial statement. He wants to sit in on just one leadership meeting. Ooh, that's that, that's a rip the bandage off and get in there and see <laughs> how things actually run. Well, that's that's uh, interesting. I, I mean, I've always been, I love the idea. Um, there's a couple of companies that I worked with with startups uh, when I was living in the in the Bay Area and the San Francisco area, um, the uh, uh, for all my Bostonian friends that are just like, stop saying Bay Area, we are Bay Area as well. Like, no. uh, <laughs> sure. but was this idea of, uh, especially with engineers, of trying them out, paying them to work on a project or for like a week or, or even you know, a day to work on a primary, but pay for their time, and good have a good idea of where they fit, you know, because I think you're right. The efficiency of meetings can be a clear indicator of the culture of that organization. Is it a one hour meeting where 20 minutes of people are sitting around chatting and it's not getting started? Um, that tells me that they don't respect individuals times or that everybody's running late or that, you know, uh, it, it might do we have the right people here to drive it? Are we waiting for somebody? I mean, kind of all those other factors. Um, how many meetings have I been in where the first question asked is like, what are we here meeting about this time? Like, what is this about? Well, this is our standing meetings. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. what are we talking about here? That's right. And there are three common reasons why people are, why we're seeing all these many meetings, right? The first one is, from a point of trying to be kind and inclusive, right? And you're just sending it out because you don't want anybody to feel left out, which is also the reason why people don't decline meetings, right? They're like, they have meeting FOMO and it's a real thing, which is yeah. mind boggling. But the second one, and this one is, I think the one that hurts us the most is laziness with technology. It's those tools that help you schedule and very easily add five more people to your invite without warning you that that's a terrible idea. Um, so that laziness of, hey, I'll just throw this on the calendar and Outlook makes it 60 minutes as opposed to maybe I only need 45 or 38 minutes. Um, and the third one, which I think that's one that really has to, you were talking about culture earlier, that really has to be something that needs to be addressed at the root cause is micromanagement, right? Like work just doesn't get done unless you do it in a meeting, which quite frankly, you're using the meeting as a crutch. There are deeper issues at the organization. Well, I mean, I, I would say right there, if then people don't, Clearly, they don't understand their roles and responsibilities and what needs to be done next if they're having to rely on the meeting and sit there and do it. I mean, certainly there are meetings where I've gone in where we said, look, this is a planning. It's more of a brainstorming. And it's not everybody. I mean, this is a higher level. It's a, the plan for the plan, which is a <laughs> legitimate type of meeting to do that. And where you're whiteboarding, where you're, you're identifying, okay, how does this look, the phases of the project, and maybe talk about the scheduling of people. Like, that's not what we're talking about here. Um, I, and I just thought of something too, when you talk about the laziness of the, of the tools, like I've had, and this isn't like one person, but I, I, I have one in mind who was terrible at this, that she would automatically accept all meeting invites. The problem was I would only invite her, my manager, when I needed her in that meeting. And she was always quadruple booked. And so I don't know if an, an acceptance, whether she would actually show up, that she would prioritize something else. And so that was something where it was, where we'd get in there, she'd not show up. And I'm like, I'm sorry to everybody else in the room. Like, we're going to have to reschedule because we need her here. Um, that's right. That, so that, that's critical. 
when I ran a governance board um, where we had clearly the, the topics to be discussed, pre-published, here's what we're going through. This is the agenda. We got to the next agenda item and the stakeholder who brought it up wasn't there. So we tabled it until the next meeting, two weeks later. And that person who didn't show up was so angry, they weren't there. Um, they were so angry that we didn't cover it. I'm like, yeah, but you weren't there. We could not move forward without you. Like, that was the point. You accepted the meeting and asked for this to be added. So it goes back. We knew the roles and responsibilities and we ended early because that major topic was not covered. That I think is addressing a major theme that I'm seeing across meetings. Our current reality of meetings is just that. We have too many to manage it in a human way. We can't even manage our work. Like you mentioned earlier, the work gets done outside of working hours, which is horrible because life is about more than work. I'm going to say that here <laughs> in, in the safe environment, <laughs> as much as I, I enjoy working, there really needs to be a focus on being real about what needs to get done, right? Prioritizing relentlessly. And I like the angle that you brought up of the different type of people, right? Because meetings are about collaboration and about how can we work better together. And somehow when it isn't managed, it gets completely out of control. And that's where we've seen a meeting culture take down business functions, take down the organization because you're starting, especially as you grow, you're just spiraling downward in terms of how you spend your time. Nobody has a clear understanding of what meetings are important, what aren't. It just is completely out of control. Do you have best practices for how you go and start tracking that? I mean, when you when you talk with, I mean, because any, you know, this is a, it's a change management question. I mean, when you look at that, you can't fix a problem if you don't have data, if you don't have a clear understanding of the scope of the problem at least the initial problem to go. And you might uncover other things as you're digging deeper, but what can organizations do to start? Like they inherently understand that we're inefficient around that, but what data points do they need to gather? That's a great question. And I think there are generally, I'll take a step back here because I think it's important to really highlight how we look at the problem. And they're generally in the world, two types of people. So imagine this, two friends walking down the river. Suddenly they see a man drowning. They jump into the water. They rescue the man, bring him back to safety, turn around, and the next person's drowning. So what do they do? They jump back in, pull the man out, and more and more people start drowning. And one of the friends is starting to walk away. The other friend looks at him and is shouting, like, what are you doing? These people are drowning. And he says, well, I'm going to walk upstream to see why they're all falling into the river, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is the shift that we're promoting in terms of how you look at the meaning problem. Because there are a lot of solutions out there that aren't really solving the problem, but rather looking at helping you manage the symptoms, right? AI transcripts and summaries and follow-up items. And if you have 20, 30, 40 meetings a week, you suddenly have 40 summaries and 40 follow-up items that you now have to read through and track and coordinate. And I'm sure there's going to be the next tool that helps you manage all of these. Um, and at Kairos, we really want to start asking questions such as, how many meet, why do we have so many meetings, right? How are these meetings the right size? Are they, do we have the right people? What is the diagnosis of the meeting problem to really understand how we can solve it? And who asks these kind of questions? Scientists, researchers. People who are generally curious, which is why curiosity is one of our core values. 
And that's why we partnered with the leading meeting scientist, Dr. Steven Rogelberg, to not just randomly come up with metrics that, you know, hey, I think this is a good idea. I think we should measure this, but rather rely on evidence-based metrics that are key contributors to meeting effectiveness. So really breaking down meeting effectiveness into the common meeting problems that then give you an opportunity to, after you start measuring it, and we all know what gets measured gets managed. Thanks, Peter Drucker. <laughs> that really gives you an opportunity to then systematically start improving those metrics. Yeah, I know that there was, um, and obviously during pandemic and, and um, where it was a little bit different scenario because we weren't doing the social things either. So they kind of blurred the lines between social and work activities and when work stopped. But it's also another part of the problem, the modern day problem is that, that we're, we're all you know, familiar with the various technologies that are out there, all the solutions. It's easy to go and do things, uh, to, to throw together a meeting and have a conversation, to jump on a quick call, pull somebody else in, share the notes, do things. Uh, and, and those are great. And, I, and again, I don't, I'm not even worried about that so much. Like we, in, in the olden days of uh, 15 plus years ago, when I was working in an office, have a question about a coworker, I'd walk over, talk to them or have them come over to my office and sit there and kind of powwow around something. We don't need a formal meeting. We're having a conversation. We're not working in a, you know, a, a, an information silo. We're working together. Um, that's not what we're talking about. There are more efficient ways to do those things. Um, and part of that comes down to, again, the cultural aspect of what the pandemic, I think, inflated the problem caused more damage is that now that we're out of that situation we're doing a lot more virtual but we're so accustomed to just reaching out to the individual and doing those things we don't think of the impact as much we don't think of you know who needs to be there it's like we'll self-select i'm going to send this out to the team jump on this is what we're working through and so it has become this you know lazy way of getting just work done um, through through that process. And we're not thinking about, uh, uh, like w one phrase I always use is that, you know, multitasking is a lie. And the reason why it's a lie is it takes time for your brain, it's, you're working on a problem, an area, a set of tasks to disconnect from that and then go jump into a completely different dialogue, another meeting. And so when you're back to back to back, unless it's around the same topics and areas, like there's time and adjustment and it's again, highly inefficient and your brain stresses out. That's when you get overloaded. That's where you start to see the burnout from that, like too much. But we're, because we can be online and connected all the time, doesn't mean we should be online and connected all the time. And Preach. <laughs> yeah. So one, of, one of the things I like I do is I, I, I'm I do not have meeting FOMO. Um, I I used to you know, travel a lot. I don't have event FOMO for that stuff. I'm like, hey, that's great. You can go and do that stuff. But I, I now look at like meeting invites and say, well, if I'm an optional and I say no to most meetings where I am optional, if I'm not a decision maker from this, especially it's great having co-pilot now is I can say, as I, as I do most days is, you know, please summarize all of the meetings or, and that were recorded and email messages that I, that are important and focus specifically where I was in the two column, not in the optional, um, and where there are specific actions, leveraging AI to be able to do that helps a lot with that process. Exactly. And I, I agree with what you just said, and I just want to clarify that for anyone who's thinking about, you know, all meetings are a waste of time. Meetings can be great. Bad meetings are bad. Yeah. But there is an opportunity to turn meetings into accelerating decision making, connecting in a meaningful way. We're just doing it wrong. <laughs> I, I, the, luckily, early on in my career, not that I've 
stuck with this, but I remember as I was became my first real project management role, um, my manager was just like, you know, like Christian, what's the agenda for this? Like, here's the template for this. Um, this is when, you know, the, the internet was not as, this is like the first half of the nineties. Um, but making sure that there was always that, and even have it printed out for the people attending in person in the meeting, here's the agenda, here's the key stakeholders. Um, here's what we're going through. These are the decisions that need to be made. And so that was a really healthy habit. And most other organizations that I joined failed at that process. Um, it, it's equally as important to do, like I'm a big fan of the postmortem, like at the end of the project, to, to learn from that entire experience. But to start out, have that as part of your meeting culture, that there is always an agenda and have people train them. Be like, look, I'm not gonna accept until I'm this, like what are we actually there to meet about? What information are you looking for? Like, what is the outcome of this meeting? That we have an initial plan, that we have a timeline, that we make key decisions, um, that we agree on the budget, whatever those things are, versus just a working session, which could probably do be done in email. Those are great questions to ask yourself. And one thing that research really promotes is meeting mindfulness and what we call a stewardship mindset. You are the steward of people's time. You are responsible as the meeting organizer to make this meeting a success, to achieve the outcome, to make sure it is engaging and inclusive because meetings, when we think about the history of meetings, and I'm sorry, this gives away how nerdy and passionate I am about the topic, but thinking about the history of meetings, they've only developed over time as a means to a more inclusive society. So this really is supposedly, meetings are not the enemy. They're supposed to give a meaningful voice to your workforce and to individuals who are incredibly smart and talented to help drive the decisions in a way that benefits the company. The yeah. challenge is, in reality, uh, people oftentimes don't have that mindfulness when it comes to quickly booking a meeting or even worse. One of my biggest pet peeves when it comes to meetings is the let's just have a follow up meeting. So now after suffering through 63 minutes of agony, the end outcome is let's just do this again. <laughs> yeah. Wait a second, Christy, we had a follow up call earlier this morning. On a <laughs> well, that yeah, yeah. Was but we, we had we had an agenda. We had specific <laughs> things that we just ran out of time in our in our schedule. So I mean, there's that's why I said it, it, this is a. It, there's a there's a way to approach meetings. Then there's the reality on the ground, and you adjust as needed. So we're not, you know, uh, uh, trying to ostracize everyone for for doing you know other other meetings. There's a lot of different style meetings. Like one thing I'm a fan of again is that you might have a small team that makes decisions and has the project, and then having a broader organizational meeting where say look again having the agenda making it clear like. We are sharing the plan that we're moving forward on. It's like, and this is an opportunity to ask questions, to understand, and to identify, did the organizers, did we miss anything within that? So if, and one thing I, I, I used to love is the ultimatum meetings, I get organized, here's what we're going through. And I would say, if like, here's what we're going through, here's the plan of record to date, this is the meeting for the final. If you don't show up, or have a representative that is able to raise an issue, make a decision kind of thing, whatever. But if you don't show up, then you concur with the plan as documented. And that, I built that into, I used to build PMOs, project management organizations. So <laughs> part of that structure was how to run these meetings and to have a governance model for moving projects from beginning to end. And part of that was, making sure people were responsible for their roles. 
That's right. Yeah, and there are, there are a number of fantastic and easy to implement meeting strategies. I prefer saying strategies over hacks. I know there's a lot of hacks out there, but it sounds like Depends if you're marketing, if you're tweeting things out, then you know using sure. hacks might drive more clicks than yeah. Anyway, exactly. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is improve the meeting effectiveness and make it relevant and meaningful. And some ways that you can do that are rephrasing the agenda that you mentioned earlier as questions. Yeah. First off, if the question is answered, that's your cue and the meeting. We've done it, right? And that yeah. might have happened after 12 minutes or 34 or 63 minutes, right? Sometimes you run long. Um, but ultimately, if you don't have questions to be answered, then should you even have this meeting? Well, that's the scope creep problem, which is a project management mm -hmm. problem that we often talk about. But it's the same is true for you just described that. I would look at that and say, are we expanding on the scope or is it within the scope? You know, the 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 error count within that. Or are we, is this a completely separate discussion? We need to table this. It's valid, but we need to separate this from our goal of answering these questions. Or That's just right. bringing that up, scuttle this whole meeting. Like, you know, until we answer that, we need to come back and, and plan around that. But there, but you're right. You can't, I used to write about um, like, what does success look like? If you don't know what your end goal is that outcome is like then that meeting will never end that project will never end because you'll constantly be adjusting and adding to that thing exactly and the scientific law for scope creep is the parkinson's law right where you will fill the time that is allocated to a given task the challenge is that might be only applicable to half the people in the meeting right now. And you know what's even more uncomfortable than declining a meeting in the first place? Dropping off in the middle of the meeting. But if the terms are changed, that's not quite fair to the attendees either, right? They haven't signed up for that. Right. Well, yeah. I, uh, that's why I, when I do sessions and I would say, look, if uh, as I get going, I, I will not be insulted if you realize five minutes into my presentation that, oh, this isn't what I thought, or he's not going to cover what I thought. That's why I always try to tell people up front, which is a great tool, is a great part of your, your method um, for running a successful meeting is, um, and I can't remember who said this famously, but it's like you tell them what you're going to talk about in the meeting. You run the meeting following that schedule. At the end of it, say, here's what we covered at each one of these things to like sign off, make sure that we did address all the points within that, that meeting, which is a great example for, for presenting at a conference. But I, my point is I would tell people is like, I will not be insulted if you realize, Hey, this wasn't what I thought I'm going to go elsewhere. Like I want, this is for you in the meeting. It's about all of us in there. If it's not being effective, if it's moved off to another topic, you know, there's personally, I don't think that there's anything wrong with you get up saying, this isn't what, like, I've got other bigger priorities than this. Like you guys are good. What find a nice way of, of, of doing that. <laughs> but uh, you know, nobody likes that, especially you're running that. And it's a small meeting. That's great in a big room with, with people, but you know, maybe the best way to do that is after that meeting to go have a conversation with the person leading that saying this was not effective here's why and it gets back to that you know are we providing feedback are we trying to be too nice when we should be more clinical in our approach and say look i appreciate everything you're doing and we it's a great conversation here however it would have been better had you done it this way if you had structured this if we had known what we're going through up front then you can have those conversations of whether you met, missed, or exceeded, you know, the, the goals of that meeting. What you're hitting at is exactly the lever that organizations have not pulled yet. Because what you're indicating is we need cultural change. We need people to be okay 
with learning and getting better and speaking up. And that needs to be systematized. I think it is really critical. And this is why, of course, we built this into Kairos as well, to have this feedback loop. Because people might not feel comfortable just standing up and leaving in the middle of the meeting, whether it's in person or remote, right? Like the hang up button, it's rude. Nobody wants to be rude. And maybe I care about you personally, Christian, you're a great friend. I don't want to insult you or I don't want you to look bad in front of the other attendees. But there needs to be a process around how can we get better because we won't solve the meeting problem if we don't make incremental challenges and changes. Well, I'd say this all the time to being in the Microsoft ecosystem. When I hear people that complain about a feature or something or the user experience wasn't this, I'm like, have you gone and provided that feedback in a number of different places? Is the problem is that how does Microsoft know to go and fix that? How do you know as and in your organization, if you don't have those feedback mechanisms, how do you know that there's a problem or what or what to go and fix next? I mean, there are some, you know, highly intuitive managers that are looking for that, but in all likelihood, they're focused on the day job doing their work. And so if they're if they're not getting these data points, they're not gonna know, certainly not how to go and fix it to make a change. That's right. And feedback does get a negative rep or surveys do every now and then. But that's because we some people tend to ask for feedback without having accountability around it. So I can ask like, hey, tell me about things that I can do better. And I have no intention of changing. I just want to hear what I'm doing well. Like, come on. Yeah. <laughs> um, but realistically, like having pairing scientific metrics and having something that shows you here is my meeting effectiveness as an organization representing my organizational health and my ability to actually achieve strategic goals and then tying it back to giving a voice to the people that are attending the meetings that really show you hey this meeting has negative ratings. This meeting is probably the product launch meeting when the product was launched three months ago. Why are we still having this meeting? <laughs> well, that's a great point. That is something that I would stress again in, in project focused organizations uh, is that you have to have that running FAQ section where those, uh, if, if people ask questions and they never get a clear answer or it never, they don't see how that question, that issue gets um, incorporated into the, the thought process. I mean, one thing that I was, I will always tell the story, I won't go into it here, but about when I had a custom swimming pool built in our home in California. And uh, you know, long story short is that the contractor, the pool builder never responded to phone calls, and provided information. There were long gaps that were not his fault. He's waiting for the city to come and check something off to be able to do that. Different vendor was late, but they wouldn't tell us that there was a week delay because it wasn't them. They were waiting for the gas line people or the water people to come do something and they're behind. I'm like, and at the end of the process, he's just like, it was a beautiful pool. And I'm like, I can't recommend it. He's like, what are you talking about? And I said, your project management skills are garbage. Like mm. all you had to do was answer my call, have somebody respond once in a while and tell me why things were delayed. Like it was a terrible experience as a project manager at the time to be living through that. Like you just, you don't do that. Uh, and so people always appreciate that when people understand, there's kind of a Buckleyism. When people understand the process, uh, when they, they then trust the process, um, then they'll, they're more likely to use the process. So when you capture the feedback and show, like, we hear you, here's why we disagree with you because of these other factors or whatever, but we heard you, we answered like, like this. People are, even if they disagree with the next step, they'll say, well, I was heard. They're more likely then to give future feedback not listening, not making that, I don't know what you call it, to synthesize that data into your planning. Mm -hmm. I, I hate that word, but 
um, to incorporate that in the planning. To not do that, they're less likely then to speak up because they think no one's going to listen. They're never going to change something. They just they move forward. It's above my pay grade. All of the other, you know, ways to get out of responsibility for, you know, even if it affects your role, your job, even if you have past experience in that area, you know, uh, you need to make sure those feedback mechanisms are there, that you're reviewing them and that you make your responses to those transparent. Exactly. And that can be a hard thing to do, even with the best of intentions. I think it really is critical to build up that flywheel. People talk about feedback loops for a reason, right? So really making sure that you automatically have a way to not just capture that feedback, but then make sure that leads into the metrics that you're looking at, the metrics that you're sharing with your people to really show here's what we're doing about it. And we found as a software company, this is something that we're doing quite differently because we found people want to do better. Everybody wants to help and everybody wants to get better. I think it is one of the, what is it, motive, inherent motivators from Daniel Pink, um, that mastery and continuous improvement. And if you have structures that help your people do just that, and this is why we've built in self-learning videos, really presenting all this content on, there's so many simple things that you can do better and pair that with small group coaching because we found, and this is another concept from Malcolm Gladwell and the outliers is if you have that small group that does things differently and that can drive those results, that listens to feedback, that implements new strategies and change, it becomes contagious across the organization where you can really take such small actions that lead to organizational change and a high performance culture. Yeah, that, I've, uh, I often refer to W. Edwards Deming and operational excellence, that whole idea, mm -hmm. of small incremental change with intent. It's part of the, the planning, but that you build a culture where you're constantly looking at prioritizing those things, but learning about the, the system. You're, you're highly efficient. Great. What can you do better is a question that's always valid, always areas. Business rules change, personnel changes, the, cultural, the culture evolves and changes, all of which you need to constantly fine tune, learn more, do more around that. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a career. It's not a project with a beginning and an end. It's an ongoing effort to look at that. And a mindset for yeah. sure. And I do see like the, those stories where we can see the impact that those small changes have and how building just a small group coaching program can completely change the trajectory of the company and the ability to accelerate momentum is that's what, that's what I love. <laughs> Well, Christy, I really appreciate you uh, joining me here at the Collab Talk podcast. It's a great topic. Of course, I'll have links out to Kairos and to your profile so people want to reach out and ask more questions. But definitely, if you're interested in looking at how do I make my meetings more efficient and effective, then you know, reach out and talk to Christy. Yeah. My door is always open. I'm, I'm happy to help. And we try to put out a lot of those strategies in simple and easily accessible formats as well. You've been listening to the Collab Talk podcast. New episodes are published weekly, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and most other podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.